Starting off with branding, we, we actually added in a couple of new sections in kind of like over the last two nights that are not on the itinerary, but we realized there were a couple of holes in what we wanted to go over. And so uh, they're kind of bonus material, and uh, we'll fill it in when we can. Wanted to start with branding down. Um, and so basically, I'm just, I, I put notes up on the screen, but I'm going to kind of expound on them. This kind of my teaching style. And again, if you have questions, please just um, raise your hand. So sometimes we start a business, we don't have much direction and never really circle back to establish reasoning for the direction we took and currently taking our business in. <clears throat> why, the, why this is so important is because, um, you know, like, like a lot of people here probably just started with weddings, you know, you had a camera, you somehow got roped into it, so a friend of you asked. Next thing you know, you shoot one wedding, you shoot 10 weddings, you're doing it full time, you quit your, your job. And it's two years later, four years later, and you never really took a hard look over what your business was. I mean, you were busy booking, and, you know, but you never really established kind of like the, what your branding is or what you want to communicate to your potential clients. And so why it's important is, is just like being able to kind of have that reflection after the fact and figure out kind of like who you are, how you want to be perceived in your local market, and to kind of move forward with that. Uh, knowing our branding helps us understand how we should be pricing ourselves and what, are, uh, what clients to target. Having a gauge of where you, currently, uh, where you are currently at is essential to getting a roadmap of where you want to go. Just kind of talking about, you know, because, um, well, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but just knowing, knowing where you're at, knowing what type of clients you want to target, knowing what type of price point you want to be at. So uh, I kind of just wanted to go over, part of branding is kind of knowing, knowing your style about, um, and I, I put down here cinematography versus documentary. This isn't a perfect example, but it, it's kind of like a starting point of figuring out what type of style you already are doing and, what, and to kind of figure out if that's really where you want to be or where, if you want to go a different direction. Cinematography, the story is told through the eyes of the cinematographer from their perspective specifically. Uh, the length of the film should be exactly the length the filmmaker chooses. Promising a film length will affect the ability to tell the story from their viewpoint correctly. Uh, it focuses on how to capture a moment, might catch one or two stunning clips versus the entirety of the moment. I, I've, <clears throat> I've had a lot of struggle with this over the years, and one of the reasons is, is because when you're delivering documentary edits of things, like you're delivering a doc edit of the ceremony, a doc edit of toasts, a doc edit of other events that are happening, and when I say doc edit, I'm talking more about kind of like the, see, you know, you're doing like three to four different cameras or, you know, I'm sorry, maybe like two to four different cameras and you're, you're mixing in the audio and you want to have that from beginning to end edit of the entirety of that event. And what happened for me was I realized that I was focusing so much on the documentary portion that I was actually uh, forsaking kind of like getting the shots I need for the creative edit. And so... <clears throat> And that's why especially like focuses on how to capture a moment might catch one or two stunning clips versus the entirety of the moment which is so important like let's say for example cake cutting or the bouquet toss which two really maybe those aren't the best but just like different events like that where you're like okay let's make sure I, I capture this creatively and I'm not so concerned about you know the beginning to end that you know we're missing the good stuff for the creative edit I think green prep's a great example <clears throat> Group especially, prep? especially for you because you uh, used to get stuck. Okay, so I'll just say, John used to get stuck <laughs> um, filming too much groom prep. Like he just felt like he needed to document everything. And then when I go into editing, he looks at what I'm, what I'm using, jacket shot, you know, cool silhouette shot, and that's it. <laughs> so it was like two years later <laughs> that Kay told me that she only uses like three of my shots. And, you know, for all the stuff that I'm getting, I'm like, well, I've been doing this for two years. Yeah. You told me now. So that's kind of like he was in documentary mindset. Like if you are just editing or yeah, a documentary of the whole day, you want to see all that stuff, um, then you can film like that. But if you're creating a, a cinematic highlight edit, then you can really just focus on the pretty shots and move on. And honestly, your time will be much more efficiently used when you're focused like that. Right. So I also put down there, um, you know, the, the hours of coverage or, you know, usage of time shifting with creative editing or the creative, uh, creative style of time shifting kind of like your hours of coverage is more about like, you know, when, when a planner sends you the schedule, it's more of like, okay, these are the hours I need. Um, documentary style, the story is told by the action and the videographer is there as a third party to document it. 
the perspective is generic third party. And again, th this, I don't want you to be fixated over kind of like these definitions I created of, of cinematography versus documentary, but just more of as a general things to think about, you know, with your own style. Like, what are you doing? What are you currently doing? Is that what you really want to be doing? And like, you know, are, maybe you're like me and you, you were putting too much focus on one area over the other. And especially putting too much focus on documentary can have an adverse effect on your creative edit. But if you're making promises for the documentary edit, it's kind of like you also have to be mindful of it because you also want to uh, fulfill that, um, those promises of delivery. The length of the film varies depending upon footage. You can achieve higher film lengths with no problems just because you're putting all the usable footage on the timeline. It doesn't really matter if it tells a story or really just if it's intriguing, engaging. We'll cover whatever hours hired and document with video coverage. So it doesn't really matter. You don't really care what hours. It's just like you have an hourly rate. Whatever they hire you for, it's just like you're there. It doesn't really matter. You're not arguing with them about, but I need to be there before you know, a certain point. I need to be there before the bride gets dressed. I need to be there before the first look. Or I, I, I don't want to be there for the final two hours of dancing because at that point it's just drunk people getting weird in the dance floor. So it's just like, so that mindset of this is what you're, you, this is what you're contracted for. I'm there. I don't really care. It's just going on the timeline. I don't really have to worry about how the story is going to come out. <clears throat> Focus is on making sure the mo moment is captured. We'll roll the entire moment and possibly try to recompose while rolling to better the shot. I mean, it's just kind of what we're talking about before with the creative edit in mind. You're thinking one or two shots. Uh, we'll get into sequencing later, but. You want to catch, it's better to, for the creative edit to just get this one or two shots versus just like let it roll the entire time. You know, even for something like cake cutting, it's just like just roll, you know, it's like we'll, we'll have two cameras and we'll vary your angles or for something else. I keep saying cake cutting because I mean, but it's really so unimportant for the day. Just trying to think of a better yeah. example, but. Hi, can I, I want to ask a question real quick. Is there anybody here that is focusing on doc edits? Like that's your style? Okay. Well, you say you kind of want to get into, you want to do more, I don't know if you want to do more story, but you're saying you needed to do something to your edits. Yeah, I just, something, you know, I can turn the box and something's missing. Something's mm -hmm. missing. Yeah. And I was telling him, I was like, I went back to my first, and I think part of that is influence. I've watched too many wedding videos and others. Oh, I like that movie, or I like that style, and you rely on gimbal work, or you rely on so much of your gear. And when I started, I had one camera and a monopod. And so I went back and looked at that first video, and I said, that's all me. And I actually, while it was not technically perfect, and it was fair, it was still me. And I got away from that. And it was more about catching those, you know, less docky, I guess, and more just telling the story today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, I, I get caught up in that chronological highlight of the day in a documentary style. I think I find myself not telling the story while um, the rise like it. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking, it's just, <clears throat> to get to that next level, you need to be able to do something more along the story. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I put on here too is just even about story, about kind of like the, the, in the edit is, you know, the, the focus point of like how the story is being told. With the more documentary approach, it feels like you're allowing the events of the day to kind of dictate what the story is. You're there to just capture it. You're rolling, you're, you'll probably have a little bit more of linear of approach. You know, if you're shooting a documentary film, it's going to have that linear feel. You're going from A to Z, you're not really going to A to Z, B, you know, then going A, D, B, A. F. You know what you know, I'm talking about, more linear approach. With the cinematic style, what I like to kind of explain it as, you're telling the story through your own eyes. And you know, you, you're deciding what the story is. And why that's important is because there's a lot of different competing storylines in a day. Not all of them are relevant, not all of them are important, and not all of them are really um, going to be important for the, to tell the story you have in mind. Um, so, did you have anything you want to say on that, or putting in a spot? Yeah. <laughs> question. In my conversations with couples, I find that they almost always want a documentary edit of a part of the day. So it looks to me like having the kind of be both, mm -hmm. which is a bit of a 
They, I think they say that, but the reality is they want this. They want the creative edit. I mean, that's just where things have gone. They want. They the, want the ceremony. They want the ceremony because they right. want to be able to. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure if anybody else, but to have or the speeches yeah. or. But they, they do want certain parts of the day filmed that way, and so if that's what I'm focusing on, how am I getting the two or three really pretty shots? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not. Maybe that's it. Buy a new camera. Buy a new camera. Well, how many cameras are you running? I'll have three, during a ceremony, I'll have three cameras and then I'll be on a gimbal. Mm -hmm. Is it just you or is it you and someone else? No, I'll have a, I'll have a, I'll have a second shooter, but he'll be on one of the station cameras. If, if we're doing a doc edit, which we do doc edits for ceremony and toasts, um, sometimes formal dances, we kind of tapered that off a little bit. But um, the doc edit does not have to be super special. We, just, we have at least a safe camera somewhere. And then two of us can at least get beautiful creative shots and edit that in into the safe camera. Um, so we do that. Well, toast is easier, but that's what we do for the ceremony. Um, so we do offer doc stuff, because um, even if the brides don't want it, the parents do stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like during the ceremony, there's a safe shot. I'm, I'm on gimbal a lot of times. John's a lot of times up front getting a different perspective. Um, so both of our shots make the highlight, but the safe shot doesn't usually make the but highlight. But the thing is, it's like, what I like to consider documentary edits kind of like a best effort. I'm not losing sleep over it. It's just kind of like you, you do what you need to do. You know, we'll have multiple angles, so we should have one usable shot at all times. The audio is always going to be important for us because we need the audio, so I don't go crazy over the doc edit stuff. It's best effort more so than the creative edits, which are going to be very polished, more than best effort. Yeah. And when I say best effort, that that's even sounds higher than maybe what we put into it. It's just kind of like we do what we should do, but we're, we're not going to be like triple or quadruple checking it at all times. And like, because it's easy to just go float between all the different cameras, make sure everything is perfect. It, it's it, the focus is, you know, we'll set up our cameras and say, OK, so what now that the doc, doc stuff is set up, let's focus on the creative edit. And then we should have enough to cover basis. And you know, we don't always. We'll have darks. We'll have you know spots where we have to fade to black or this or that. And you know, the thing is, you know, th this is the amount of people who have complained about a documentary edit that we've done. <laughs> you know, but if you miss if you miss creative moments or if you miss the creative shots, you'll more than likely hear about that. And that's why it's just it's kind of like a priorities thing that I think in our own minds we, we could tend to kind of prioritize this, these documentary portions higher than they need to be prioritized. And you know, even though the mom or whoever is saying that the, you know these elements, the ceremony, are really important to them, it's it's really. I mean, you can give them a really rough edit of the ceremony, and they're probably happy. And so you're. This is the level that you're approaching it at. This is the level that they would be happy at. Ironically, so, I had a bride. She, she was going to pass me when I was about to finish her wedding, and I said, I'm just about done. Finish the toast. I'm like, I'm going to go back and and, and she just like blew up nine minutes. I was expecting two or three. I'm thinking, I wish I'd have known that. <laughs> you know? And she said, How am I going to show that to everyone? I mean, that's like too long. I said, Look, I'm almost done. I'll send it to you. You tell me what you want to take out. So I sent her the, the wedding, and I was like, Sure, 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 crickets. I said, What do you want me to take out? Nothing. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't thinking, you know, she said, I can't imagine taking something from that and, 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 and removing it. You can't, I don't want to take anything. I was just, you know. But it's funny what sometimes I said, if you not looked at any of my other work when you hired me, you know, that's usually what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So it's funny how sometimes, you know, I've got a longer one and they want something shorter. And that's the second time it's going to happen. But then when you show it to them, they don't want to change it. I thought the story was going to go opposite, where she wanted it two to three hours long. Yeah, I did, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I was just like, hey, but you know, of course, we're jumping again here. But I mean, you had an op you have an opportunity right there to say, well, if you want the two to three minute edit, here's a price for that, and I'd be happy to cut it, cut a separate film a down teaser, for you, a trailer, a teaser I trailer film for you. We'll get into that with the upsells por portion. When you do uh, the updates, a good question. Uh, regarding the uh, locket, let's say you do a uh, ceremony in the outdoors and you have these safety cameras and you try to hide and you know, 
cloud moving, social changes, and you don't have another structure. So you're sitting at the editing, and uh, you notice that the white balance is all between this one. Do you bother with that? Or I do. I color correct the okay. ceremony. Even if it's like it's just off by like ten seconds because that cloud came back in. Uh, no, uh, no. If it's like a because it. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Like turns and blue and then turns the yellow. Okay. I I have before, and I had so many like cuts and transitions to try to fade the color correction, and I'm like, never again. <laughs> it got so. It's a puzzle. So. I don't know if Kate knows this, but sometimes I'll set the back camera to auto ISO, <laughs> especially, but <clears throat> only when. I do not recommend that. <laughs> no, 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 no. When the sun is setting. When the sun is setting, because if you do a ceremony outside and the sun is setting and you have a third camera that is unmanned and you go back to the camera and it's dark mm -hmm. and it's like every five minutes, it's like it needs a bump in the, uh, in the exposure. So I'll set it to auto ISO. I use exposure compensation because we typically uh, like our stuff a little darker. So I'll, I'll set the exposure compensation down a little bit, auto ISO, and it's better than just leaving it and coming back 20 minutes and realizing it's black. Okay, for sunset, it makes sense. For sunsets. Yeah. For the clouds in and out, um, we expose for the clouds being out, uh, for, the for the direct highlights. sunlight. Yeah. And then when the clouds come in, it darkens the shot. A uh, whole other story, but the, our style is more for exposing for the highlights um, than, uh, than exposing for the, low, uh, for the dark, which is a little counterintuitive these days. I guess a lot of people kind of like that, that bright, airy look, but don't give me an impangent right now. <laughs> What's that? Uh, real, real quick, I know you were talking about getting like the We're not we're not creative and like we're trying to do anything crazy during those moments. Uh, we definitely capture side angles of the vowels at least when we can. Um, so that's technically kind of a safe shot, but it's definitely going to make the film. So we're very careful to make those very, very safe because those are so important. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about safe cameras, it's just like that back, back wide shot, just so we can cut to for the edit. Like, yeah. <clears throat> so again, this kind of wraps up the whole creative ver or the cinematography versus documentary. Important for branding, kind of circling back to this whole idea about branding, because it's great. It's a great reflection to understand where you're at, and if you're not at where you want to be as, as a self-reflection moment to say, hey, you know, maybe I'm focusing a little bit too much on documentary. Maybe it is holding me back creatively on the creative edits and maybe need to make some adjustments to kind of um, focus on the creative stuff a little bit more. <clears throat> and most videographers take a hybrid approach on a creative edit. Um, uh, most videographers are able to create a documentary film for the major events, such as ceremony, toasts, formal dances, etc. Don't lose focus of what your primary objective is. If you're there to make a creative edit, don't let the documentary edit get in the way of that. Again, hi hybrid approach just meaning that, you know, there's no one or not many people who are just like 100% creative. And I guess there's people, there, there are some studios who are like that. Those are the studios who maybe uh, they don't record any audio and, they, and their final deliverable is going to be just kind of like a, a music video style uh, film. And it, 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 which is definitely, a, it is a great film, plenty of market out for that. Our style is more of, you know, we, we, we want to have a narrative. You know, we, we like the storytelling aspect of the film, but we also understand the importance of you know, kind of like the cinematography uh, portion. Because uh, at the end of the day, you want to wow them on the cinematics, but you also want to then in hook them and engage them on the story as well. And, you know, for what we found with our business and our brand is we have both of those elements that way you know, we, we can create an engaging film both with the cinematics and, and with the storytelling. Um, important question to ask, what is, the def what is your definition of a success? This is your why. Time freedom, financial freedom, creative freedom. It's an important question to ask because, you know, first of all, not everyone is full time. You know, it, it, maybe you don't need the money. Maybe you're living off a trust fund and your, your goal in life is to create beautiful wedding films and you're, you know, you're denying people left and right, you know, just because you're waiting for like the perfect uh, opportunities to come into perfect films that'll inspire you creatively. I'm sure none of us are here are like that, but just in general, understanding why, why you do what you do. 
time freedom. You know, uh, a lot of us do, um, do what we do uh, with the businesses for time freedom. Maybe, you know, we want to be able to put in our solid 20 hours a week and then have free time during the week to do other things. You know, you can, you can dictate how much time you have based upon how much you want to work. Financial freedom, maybe uh, you just, you're just like, wow, this is a cash cow and I can book 100 weddings a year and not sleep, not have any friends. <laughs> okay, but that's not, that's not. I'm going on the extremes. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that, but that's where it all ends up. We're all home and editing with no friends, never see your family. Uh, but, you know, financial freedom, but you're making good money. You, you, you're doing this because you want to be able to enjoy life. You want to pay down your mortgage. You want to be able to, you know, you like, buy, nice things. you like nice things. You like to eat out all the time. You're dictating the lifestyle that you want. Or creative freedom, just basically like, you know, you, you want that, you, you want to be inspired creatively. Like you, you're in wedding filmmaking because you love the beauty that weddings have. You know, you, you, you like certain types of wedding films and you want to focus on those films. You know, maybe, maybe you feel more apt to kind of decline certain other films that aren't really your style and are things you want to be focusing on creatively. It's a great question to ask yourself why you're doing this because I find a lot of people are kind of somewhere between time freedom and financial freedom. Um, but it's a, it's a great question to ask. It's a, and reason being going forward, it'll kind of determine how you run your business. Randy, knowing your target client, are you specifically going after a segment of the market to hire you, either a segment looking, to your, um, looking for your style or maybe cultural weddings? All part of you know, is all circles back to branding. It, it circles back to kind of what you're focusing on. Um, the, you know, uh, gentlemen over here, uh, south, you're going for the south, or you were in the market for southwest or east. southeast, no, south Asian market, south Asian market um, and that's kind of like the, it's part of your branding. It's part of um, people know you for. Um, there are some people who only want to do rustic weddings. You want to do farm weddings. You want to do weddings. Um, <clears throat> in ballrooms and or Scotland or Scotland <laughs> or Iceland you know but part of part of the branding is figuring out what type of um, what type of weddings you want to do what type of market you want to be in and you know just kind of being able to identify that and it's it, it, it all ties together with kind of like how you market yourself and who you go after is having a connection important would you say no to a client if you don't connect I actually there's a lot of talk on forums uh, you know, people in, I find it's more with uh, people who are v very creative, who, who love the idea of turning down a client if they don't mesh with the client. And um, it, I, I just bring it up because, you know, is having a connection important? You know, <clears throat> if you don't mesh with them, do you want to work with them? Um, which kind of dictates kind of like the direction your, your business can go in. Has, it, has anyone done that, declined a client because... I think part of that too, like it could be your branding might not be honing on, on the people that you're wanting to attract. So mm -hmm. that's a, a sign that you might need to do something with your branding. Yeah. So. Or maybe your target client is anyone that could afford your pricing. It's a great place to be. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of wedding? I don't care. Just say, you know, do, do you like your stuff? Do you, or, you know, I mean, we, we've, we've all been there. Just like, just do some bookings. The, the, um, the brand question. Because I feel like, I mean, I just haven't filmed enough weddings to know, have an idea of what I want it to be. Um, and that shit, it was, it's almost like I've got to be several years down the road before I start asking questions. And that, that's why, uh, you know, the, even the, the first slide I brought up was about kind of like doing that self reflection after being in business for a couple of years because oftentimes you do start and you don't really have any sort of real direction and you're just booking weddings. You don't know really what you're doing. You're just booking weddings. People are paying you. You, you. You try to figure out, like blindly reaching out, figuring out how to market yourself and how to get more clients. And at some point, you know, you do figure out like, are you, are, do you like what you're doing? Do you like, the, do you like the type of weddings you're doing? Are there certain weddings you'd rather be doing? Um, you know, it's kind of like your why. If like, you know, are you drawn to creatively if you're drawn creative to kind of like the creative aspect, you're probably going to want to focus more on like a subsect of certain types of weddings to focus on those. You know, because there's a whole bunch of people, especially out in like the Colorado area, who focus on those like adventure weddings, so, you know, like White and Reverie. And th those are their types of weddings. They don't want to be in a ballroom. You know, they want to be outside 
doing, you know, up Adventure. in the mountains, uh, getting that type of stuff. And that, that is, they're, they're drawn by like the, the creative side. Um, so it's, it's really figuring out what's driving you, what's driving your business. You know, if it is about, you know, creative, then figuring out what type of weddings you like to do, kind of honing in on that. You know, if you want to be doing only one type of wedding, kind of focusing and figuring out how to focus in on getting more clients that kind of have that type of um, what you want in a wedding. And if, if that doesn't bother you as much, it's really just, if it's more about time, then you can just choose whichever weddings you want to do again. But it's more about the money, if, if you're about the financial freedom, then really it's just about growing your business to just attract anyone who's attracted to your style and will pay the, the premium price that you determine. You know, it's funny because you know, I'm kind of at that point where I want to get to that next level, but I was booking anybody that would pay me. And so then you find yourself, especially in Middle Tennessee, at these lower end budget, and you, you're in that rut, and, and, and so, you get on that, you're on that level, and everybody's you know, on that level, and you look at the, the Facebook forums and, and the Middle Tennessee Wedding Forum, and, and, and you know, looking for a videographer, and there's 50 or 60 comments, and everybody's a videographer. And so you start looking at the work, and they're all, I mean, probably more than three fourths of them are within $100 of each other in pricing. And you're looking at your, you're looking at everybody's work, and you're thinking, how can I set myself apart from these 50 people? And, and so, so you look at the work, and you, and it's the same <coughs> kind of style, same everything. And, and so you have to brand yourself in order to stand out. <laughs> and so, what can you do to make yourself? How do I get myself out of this hole? <laughs> Of low budget, low paying products. And we're going to go over that too because, and one of the things I forgot to mention is well, the style of the workshop that I wanted to create was to have practical tips at the end of every section on how to implement what it is we're talking about. Because um, it, it's really easy to go to a workshop or some type of event, get truly inspired, and you know it's going to change your life, change your world. But then, like a week or two goes by, and you don't really have any actionable items and kind of like that excitement fizzles out a little bit and you kind of just go back into wherever you were. So what I, want to, what I want to do and what I focus a lot on is creating practical steps because I want you all to have actionable items to go home to think about. You know, focus on one thing, focus on two things. You know, you could take notes and maybe focus on other things later. But we'll go over that in just a little bit and if there's still questions you have after that. Sorry, I did want to say something since we're on um, knowing your target client. So branding is people's perception of you. The, their, their perception can be anything you want it to be. So you have to decide, do you want to look high end? Do you want to look hipster? Do you want to look Southern Belle? Do you want, so that'll attract those people. Um, and so that's also knowing like what kind of target people you're trying to get. Did I finish that right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Like I said, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to it a little bit. Pricing is always relative to how many people are inquiring and how many, um, uh, pricing for your target client, sorry. Pricing is always relative to how many people are inquiring and how many weddings you want to book. Uh, people who value your work will splurge. I mean, uh, high-end market. It's just talking about like, it's kind of a more just an abstract for now, but just talking about how you want to um, price for your target client. Because if you're going after top dollar, it's going to look a lot different than if you were just going for a certain subsect, subsect of weddings. Um, you know, people who are going after more the creative style and want the weddings that they want to be shooting aren't going to be able to, um, aren't going to be able to get top dollar necessarily for their weddings because they're more interested in getting more of the weddings that they want to be doing. So it's just kind of like a focus on, you know, how you're pricing for your target client. But also for that, if you are trying to build more of a luxury brand, but you, they see your price, like, so let's say you're, we have a beautiful website, it looks super luxury, and then your prices start at $1,500, they're gonna be like, oh, this is not what I want. So that's actually set some sales psychology, I don't know if you're gonna get into that, but it's also pricing for the type of client target you, you're looking for. Yeah, we'll get into more pricing later. All right, finding your, uh, branding, finding your niche, uh, the type of wedding, rustic versus ballroom versus adventure versus destination. Destination is another one um, type of branding you could do. 
which is exists mostly online because that's where your leads are going to be coming from. Online, I mean, there are some destination planners as well. Um, specializing in cultural weddings. You know, we kind of talked about this already. The style of editing, classic versus trendy. Um, you know, what it, you know, this is something, you know, branding that you could be known for. Classic style, just kind of like a timeless, uh, timeless, uh, you know, good, good cinema, good storytelling. It's timeless. Uh, you can go the more trendy route, you know, where you could focus more on speed ramping. You could focus more on a lot of, ex a lot of slow motion, focusing on, you know, um, I'll give an example of a someone in our local market who is definitely outside of the classic style. Um, Mark Lynn with Emotion Films um, it is definitely more of an abstract film. Super edgy. Super edgy, super abstract. And you know, there's a market for it. There's people who are looking for that type of stuff. And the thing is, it's like, you know, with, 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 um, with Mark's style, and there's a lot of other people who do uh, style films like this, people who are looking for that style in this market are going to find him, you know, because he's branded himself like that. And, you know, it's just finding a, ni a niche that he can kind of uh, focus on and capitalize so people who are looking for that style of film are going to focus in on him. Is an Irish film like one that is really edgy? I don't think Irish is that. Look up Emotion, um, Mark in England, or Mark and Tracy England. They're, they're definitely edgy. They're, they're, they're a local example of someone who focuses on a total. I'm sorry? Emotion films. Oh, the, the, one that the mansion. Yeah. <laughs> the mansion. England estate. <laughs> yeah, that's like four hours. It's, it's far away, but it's absolutely gorgeous. They're, they're going to have a great time there. Um, let me just do this. Sorry, did I have a double slide? Uh, all right, branding. What is it? Kay we went over this before. I just wanted to give the, you know, I feel like this is like, you know, starting off a toast, Webster's Dictionary defines love, or <laughs> how many of us have had a toast that started off with, like, Webster's Dictionary <laughs> defines, or? Don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to throw this in. The process of uh, businessdictionary.com defines branding as the process involved in creating a unique name, an image for a product in the consumer's mind, mainly through advertising campaigns with a consistent theme. Branding aims to establish a significant and differentiated presence in a market that attracts and retains loyal customers. Here's what we say. Branding is people's per perception of you. Branding is a culmination of your image and services perceived worth in your market. What type of wedding, would, uh, what type of wedding or client would someone refer to you? Um, you know, for us, the branding we go uh, for is kind of more just like ballroom type stuff. We love doing ballroom weddings um, and we hope that people think of us when they're thinking about that type of wedding. If you're thinking about other weddings, like um, like I said, you know, kind of like farm weddings, rustic weddings, we've kind of moved ourselves out of that. And it's just, it's what we, you know, if, if you're talking to a planner or a photographer who knows you, what do they think of when they think of your business? You know, and that, that's that's important part of branding, what, uh, what other people's perception of your, of your business is. How is branding established and determined? Your logo, website, and social media presence, which communicates your image, uh, the quality of work you produce, your image and reputation, being known and by the right people, people in your industry should know you, how do people feel when they hear you, um, how they hear you are a part of the vendor team. Like if people hear that you know, you're part of, the, you're doing the video, are they, are they excited to be working with you? Do they know you? Um, have they worked with you before? What's your reputation as even as a vendor? How easy are you to work with? Um, it's really important though about your logo, your website in, in terms of like branding. Um, I was going to get into this more on the practical side, but one, one tidbit of wisdom that was given to us years ago was that when people go to your website, and, and, and this is a great thing to do with you know, fresh eyes, go to your website, what do you feel like you're communicating? You know, ask a friend or a colleague to go to your website for you and ask them what, what, what do you kind of feel? What do you feel that the branding is? Do you feel that this is more of like a higher end? Or does this feel like what, am I communicating the image that you want to be communicating? So what happened with us is that we were going after a certain type of wedding, but when we went to our website, we, we realized that even like the color scheme, um, everything from the color scheme, the fonts, 
Even the wedding films that we had on the front page of our website were not communicating the target client that we wanted. So um, that, that's actually coming up just a little bit, getting ahead of myself again. Why would you want to change your branding? Your target, your target client has changed. We used to target more rustic weddings and we switched <laughs> to targeting ballroom style weddings. Um, great reason your target client has changed or your price point has changed. A rebrand can make you feel more boutique. You aren't attracting couples with higher budgets if you're trying to attract couples with higher budgets. Uh, maybe your company in its infancy made some mistakes which led to bad reviews or reputations that you want to move past. Um, changing your branding can help you narrow down your potential client base which separates you and makes clients eager to hire you. Um, yeah, I think a lot, of, a lot of people, when we talk about branding, they, they want to kind of move past the you know, because, you know, if, if planners are referring you and they think of you as, you know, like the $1,000 wedding film company, changing your branding um, is going to help the perception and even in the planners' minds of saying, well, okay, you know, maybe they used to be the $1,000 video company, but they've moved past that and now they're, now they're creating quality stuff. Their image, their, everything that's communicated on their website is now communicating a higher style, um, which in turn will lead to a higher price point. Am I going too fast or am I... You're leaving good. anything out? I don't think so. Sorry, I feel like I'm trying to catch up in a little bit lost time. But uh, any, uh, does anyone have anything they want to talk about with branding so far? Or I mean, I'm going through a complete rebrand. What are some tips? Uh, I'm, I'm, right, I'm right in the middle of it. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe okay. Maybe I should open up questions after this. So again, we want to leave you off with practical steps to make uh, positive changes to your brand branding. Again, you know, branding is, is a very tough thing to kind of nail down. It, it, you know, it, think of it as a large ship. You know, it's a, it takes a while to turn. It's going to take a while to turn the perception of who your company is. It starts off with ch minor changes and it could take a couple of years. You know, it could take a couple of years to really kind of like change that perception of, your, of what other people think of you. Especially if you're going from a low tier to mid tier, from a mid tier to higher tier because there's already a lot of people who perceive you one way, but then you know, you're kind of changing all that. And also when you change, especially if you're jumping from mid to high, you have to change your own, like you feel almost uncomfortable branding yourself as luxury. You're like, oh, am I luxury? Like, and you don't feel it yet. So that's something else that'll take a little while to settle in and you'll start getting comfortable with those price points and everything. And it'll feel like you. All right, practical steps. Is your website and social media presence communicating the style of client you want, not the style you already shoot? Which is what I was saying before with like, you know, do a, do a look at your own website, have someone else look at it. What is it communicating? <clears throat> if you're going after higher end weddings, are, are the main weddings that are kind of more visible on your website, do they speak higher end? Do they speak the weddings that you want to be shooting? And if they don't, you need to put those types of weddings up there. Because you know, it always comes back to the fishing analogies of you know, using the right bait to get the right type of fish that you want. So I, I don't fish. I don't know why I use <laughs> fishing analogies, but it always, it always seems to make sense. Maybe you mostly shoot rustic weddings but want to move more into ballroom weddings. Are the weddings you have displayed showcasing the weddings you get or the weddings you want, if not showcase the weddings you want to be getting? And if you don't have the weddings that you want to be shooting, you know, put yourself out there. Just, you know, do whatever you can to try to um, market to those weddings you want to be shooting. Maybe you, you want to do more ballroom weddings and, um, you know, put feelers out with any planners you have re um, relationships with and saying, hey, willing to offer, um, willing to offer a special one-time deal for any type of wedding uh, that happens to be in a ballroom. Maybe something specific that you want to shoot at. You know, Four Seasons, St. Regis, Ritz-Carlton, you know, um, get that one and then put the, then then shoot that wedding like it's going to be like if you're getting paid fifteen hundred dollars to shoot that wedding but you want to be earning five thousand dollars for every wedding film you do shoot that wedding as if it was a five thousand dollar wedding film you know that or one, ten or ten <laughs> twenty shoot that wedding like it's going to you know you want that wedding to be a slam dunk because then when you start raising your pricing you have to shoot you have to shoot the type of you have to shoot ahead of the price you're making. So it, what, if you guys are at $1,500, you want to be doing $3,000 wedding films. One of the biggest mistakes is that people are shooting them like they're $1,500 wedding films. What is your competition at $3,000 doing? 
to you know, make sure that your wedding films are on par with uh, the market that you want to push into. Because if they're not, and you raise your pricing, you're not going to get many people biting. Start shooting ahead of the price point you're making, you know, which means working harder, which means uh, you know, elevating yourself, you know, which, which ultimately means you know you're not getting paid your worth on that wedding. But it's, nece it's a necessary step to start getting the weddings that you want to be doing. And it might even require getting more shooters. Might require getting more shooters. Like if you're a solo shooter, get a, get a second shooter. If you've got two shooters and you just can't really quite make it work with two shooters, get a third shooter, you know, for maybe four hours a day just to kind of help you out with getting those shots you need. Create a better wedding film that, than you're pricing yourself for. And you'll find it a lot easier to break into a higher price point. Because, I mean, the reality is when, peop when clients are looking you up, I'm actually amazed at how few clients actually look at our work before they inquire. And that's actually one of the first questions I ask. And it's intriguing to find out that so many haven't even seen any of our films. They're just, you know, they got a bunch of referrals and they're just contacting for pricing. Um, but the ones who do look at your stuff will probably look at one or two films. You'll get some people who will watch everything you've ever done, but most of them are one or two. You don't have to have five years worth of amazing films to land better clients. Have one or two, have one or two wedding films on your website that communicate where you want to go in terms of branding, where you want to go in terms of pricing, and you'll find it a lot easier of attracting those clients and getting the money you want for those, uh, for those, for those clients. I have a question. Uh, this, one of my issues is um, uh, when I shot all those weddings in 2017, I shot many weddings that in, in this time that I didn't where I wanted to be, but I found myself just editing them really quickly because I had too many. Mm -hmm. So do you recommend probably hiring uh, outsourcing for a more expensive edit or more creative uh, edit just so you can come up with that? If you're like stuck with it, Are you worried about time or are you worried more about not being able to kind of elevate your editing style to the level? I'm stuck in a, in, in a, in a vicious circle where I have time, I want the time, but uh, I need to pay the rent, so I have to take a job, so, mm -hmm. so, so I'm stuck there, you know, and then when the good end comes, or when the good uh, wedding comes, the one that I want, I find myself not having the, the creative energy all, all the time. Then if you need, then if, uh, the question was about, you know, not having the time to kind of create those edits. Um, even though I shot, I got the shots. And even though the <laughs> shooting was there. I would say hire an editor to do the other weddings than the one that is going to be the one that you use to attract the other ones. That's the one you pour yourself into. And then, you know, when you get the other edits back, you know, make sure that it kind of still kind of speaks to your brand. Because you, you do want to make sure that you're consistent in all the work you do. But that, that one or two that are going to be the ones that you use to book future weddings, you want those weddings to be polished in every regard. And what else you could do with editing, and it actually might be more cost efficient this way, if you hire an editor just to cull the footage, do the doc edits, and organize it for you, and then hands it over, that would, then you can do all the creative stuff. Because I feel like culling takes like a whole, like that's half of it. <laughs> so. Um, just going back to branding, um, is it that is That's great. That's great info. That was great to share. It's fine. <laughs>
Which we, we haven't contacted uh, Branding. We, we, we were just kind of figuring it out. We've been talking to, I mean, how we established our, our own branding was, um, how did we establish it? <laughs> well, I do all the website stuff and basically as, let's get a new logo. So I play around with some fonts and made a logo. <laughs> but I mean, I guess honestly what I did was I did look up, you know, Rolex. What does Rolex website look like? What does uh, Louis Vuitton? You know, I'm actually not, not even so much the website because I feel like websites have actually really changed a lot with products. Um, but like the fonts that they're using, they are very clean, classic, and timeless. And so we want to go for timeless video. So um, we're looking for that timeless feel. So um, I know you're all thinking, what do I do? She does all the website, all the right. editing. <laughs> <laughs> She's lead shooter. Uh, I don't know what I do. <laughs> He's on Facebook and forums. <laughs> <laughs> Changing your company name is the quickest way for a brand overhaul, but that comes with re repercussions. We did a, a name change a few years ago. We, we were originally known as White Dress Media, and we changed our name to uh, Jonathan and Kay because we wanted it to have more of a boutique feel. Um, well, I also, it was before John came on, and I did have teams. And so I didn't want to have names associated with the brand. And so it could have been any of my shooters. So once I, we started doing it together, then it was just us. And I thought it was important for our couples to know that. So. Repercussions, so <laughs> um, with the changing your name, uh, people don't realize it's you. I mean, when we moved back to Atlanta, a lot of people still weren't, didn't realize we'd moved back because we changed our name. And so even for like two years, they're like, oh, you're, you're here? We didn't know it was you. But and, you know, of course, if you're trying to escape a bad brand, you know, or bad something, it's easy to just rebrand. Of course, we've heard a lot of wedding companies who just, never mind, I want to get that, flee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be known in your industry, more on this in the networking segment. Uh, branding is a lot to do with, you know, because the thing is, you, you can't just have good branding, you have to be known. You know, if you didn't know Rolex, if they just were hiding by themselves, you know, part of the branding is the perception of that brand in your market. And so being known even in your local market, like if you're in Tennessee, if you're in Atlanta, who knows you? You know, because if nobody knows you, then it's going to not be good for your branding. Fast, uh, foster relationships with people in the wedding community. Uh, again, all about, you know, getting more people to kind of know about your brand, uh, to know who you are. Um, oh, I'm sorry, just because of changes to your branding, it, it's, it's about, um, it's just about getting, getting, the, getting people to know you. Getting people to know you, getting people to know who you are, um, your business is really important for branding because it helps, a, the more people who know your brand, it's a positive thing. You don't necessarily have to have a high-end brand. You ha um, having a known brand is as important as having um, a high-end brand because again, you, know, you want more people to know you and what you have to offer. Um, changes to your brand, produce higher quality films. Maybe this is too obvious, but it needs to be addressed. So it is possible to have a great brand without great films. We've all seen those companies where like, how do they exist? Uh, they, they book like however many weddings a year. Their films, uh, it does, we don't understand how they're attracting the, the clients they have with the price point they have, but they do. Um, it just speaks to the fact that they, that they have good branding. It speaks to the fact that they, they've built a great business. They've, they, they've done all the business side correctly. Or recognition. Or recognition. Yeah. And it's just all about just you know, having that positive perception of your brand in the industry. Um, find your own unique style. You know, we were talking about this before. It's okay to find films out there that inspire you creatively. Use them as a beacon to direct you towards its style, but find your own uniqueness and direction. Being unique is important to separate you from the pack of competition you are up against. Um, you know, you know that, you, you even said it, you had brides that reach out to you and haven't even looked at your work, which is the price shop. So you're in a list of 40 to 50 videographers that this bride has. They're not looking at your work. They're looking at the bottom dollar. So Brian is at $2,000, I'm not, but you're at $2,000, and Mike is at 500 Hey, I'm going with Mike. Mm -hmm. I don't care what his stuff looks like. I mean, they're, I mean, they're just so much of that. Well, they, 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 they could be, they could be, and I'm actually going to go over more about this with the sales side, because there are ways to convert those people. But that's and also why it's so important to have a really brand, uh, website that speaks your brand and who you are. 
um, because they'll be attracted to one more than the other. And the price, they might be willing to fluctuate on the price if they're really attracted to your brand. So. <laughs> you know, right. No, if, if I asked who here, who here has time to have a good website and highly curated social media platform, nobody does. I, I, don't, I don't know if I trust any business that has too curated of a social media. <laughs> Are they working? How do they have that much time? Taylor does. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go crazy being unique. Sometimes just being the best at a classic style, not following the trends is all the uniqueness you need to stand out. Just being the best you, just refining your style, refining the films that you put out is, um, can be um, all you need to do for your branding. Just a little bit more. Be better at customer service. High end plan when you start dealing with more high end planners, um, being better at customer service is more of a high higher end um, branding part. Uh, just you know, the, the higher up you go with, with with clientele, they expect higher levels of customer service. So having great customer service can really um, affect how you're perceived. Most more likely with you know planners because they're the ones that are going to get feedback from their clients about you know how you were. Because they ask those types of questions, they want to know. So th that all trickles back to being having a higher perceived. I think I'm hitting the wrong button. Oh, no, I'm hitting the wrong button. That's what I'm doing. In many industries, exceptional customer service goes hand in hand with hiring brands. Increase your customer service to potential clients, current clients, and planners. Be better at communication. Be courteous and be as easy to work with as possible. I was talking about that. High end clients can sometimes expect more from customer service than they do the final deliverable. So true. They, they, they care about how quickly you already email. You know, like, I can't tell you how many times I've sent out a film. They're like, great, thanks. And, you know, it's more. <laughs> Have you ever sent out a film that you just poured your life into and you get an email back and you say, thanks, looks great. And you're like, do you want to say anything more? <laughs> and finally, I'm just like, all right. Really enjoyed the final product. Right. So or we still get those, by the way. So. Or, even, or even the worst. The, the worst thing you can get is when they say, thanks, can't wait to see the, the, uh, the, the final, rest. the bigger film or <laughs> the, the next film or, and you have to break it to them, you're like, well, you're only getting one. <laughs> I think this is the last one. Be careful what you are associating yourself with. At first, it's great to be everywhere, but once you are established, limit the events you participate in. Don't be common, be a commodity. You know, and the reason I put this in is that when you're getting yourself out there, it, you, have the, you can have that knack for just participating in everything. But you know, if you're everywhere, it's great at first, it's great at getting that perception, that recognition of yourself and your business, but it can have the side effect of now you're, now you're just common. You know, it's just kind of like, you want to figure out what you want to associate with in terms of you know, style shoots, in terms of other industry things that are happening. Um, don't be the guy who volunteers for everything because then you're commonplace, then it'll affect how your branding is perceived. You are a reflection of your brand if you're associated with the business. Even casual social interactions on social media are seen as an extension of your brand. This is one of my biggest things about branding that I think is so important is how you represent yourself even on social media. And um, I've seen things happen on social media where you know, vendors you know, get a little bit too comfortable with what they post and you're like, I'm not going to tell you what you can or can't post, but be, acknowledge the fact that you know, when you're on like Facebook and you're friends with a lot of planners, these people who are referring you, you know, having a high end, having a higher end brand means carrying yourself in a certain way, you know, because if a planner sees you posting weird stuff on social media, questionable stuff, which is you, every right to do as a free citizen, but the repercussions of that would, could be that, you know, if like let's say the planner sees some stuff and then they're like, wow, th this person does not carry um, the tact type of or tact or professionalism that I would want them to have with my client. So it, it's really important to think about how you are perceived even on social media. Important for your branding. Is anyone, uh, is, do you guys kind of know what I mean about that? About like, we've all done things where, have you ever posted something and you quickly delete it? You're like, I don't want to be associated with that. Like, <laughs> but I have seen I have seen uh, vendors get into it on Facebook, and you know, it usually involves politics. And you know, I, I've actually seen planners say things like, "I can't believe I used to refer you to my clients," and you know, it's 
It's not, I'm not getting into the argument about free speech, I'm just getting into the argument of be careful about how you're perceived and how, how you communicate yourself on those types of platforms. Ask friends who aren't in the wedding industry to look at your web presence and evaluate how you come across. Having a different perspective helps with your blind spots. It's just what I was talking about before. Just have a friend, a colleague, just say, take a look at my stuff. How do you think I'm being perceived? Um, how do you think I'm coming across? If you are newer to the industry, don't focus on trying to have a high-end brand. Focus on having a well-known and liked brand. Well-known and liked. Being easy to work with. You know, don't be the videographer. I mean, this is a whole other discussion, but be the videographer who's easy to work with on a wedding day, who's easy to work with with the, the planner, easy to work with with the photographer. And sometimes being easy to work with, all it means is that you communicate well. That, that, that communicating well solves like 95% of all issues. Communicating to the photographer beforehand what you plan on doing, just getting on the same page, communicating with the planner, letting them know that you received their timeline, letting them know uh, what hours you'll be there. Great communication is the easiest way to have a positive impact on your brand. Questions? Do y'all reach out to a photographer you haven't worked with them before? I do. I usually just say hi. And I actually, um, I actually touch on that later on in uh, one of, I forget which segment it is, but I do reach out to them ahead of time. I think it's just, e if you want to have good communication on a wedding day, I think that starts with uh, pre-wedding. And you know, the thing is, it's like, even if, it, even if you want to get on the whole subject of, it looks great to you to reach out to a photographer because you, other vendors, uh, I'm going into a whole different section, but other vendors will refer out people that they like, not the people who are the best. And just reaching out, starting that dialogue, starting that communication is easy street to being liked. It's because most people don't. And just saying, hey, I'm just excited to be working with you. Just want to let you know that you know we'll be working together. Let them know that you value what they do. Um, you value photography. You want to work together because the client, ultimately you're both there to serve the client. Starting off with something like that, um, just it's, it's really helps out with fostering great communication going into the wedding and having that baseline of communication helps when the photographer gets in their zone during the portraits and they totally exclude you. And then you're like, you want to be like, hey, do you mind if I step in here real quick? I just want to grab the shot. You've already had that baseline of communication and they're like, oh yeah, yeah sure, sorry. But if, you, if you're just, if you don't reach out and you're ignoring them most of the day, then you start butting heads and you, then you start asking for things. It's us versus them. It, it turns into an us versus them type of mentality and it just helps kind of avoid that. So if you, um, you know, you're a big proponent of like reaching out and talking to them beforehand, but you don't know their experience level, like you've never met them before, you don't know how many weddings they've done, if they've ever done a wedding before. Um, like how do you, are you gonna go into like, what if something comes up later or is this the time to talk about that? I, um, the question was about what do we talk about with the photographer ahead of time. I don't really get into details about the how or the why. It's mostly just about like the just starting a friendly introduction. And then you know, it, for me, it's just all about fostering that communication. So that way, when I do talk to them about you know, getting game plans on the wedding day, we've already have established communication. And it just feels a lot easier to jump in at that point than to kind of start off cold. And you know, you're you realize you're saying to them, oh, hey, do you mind if I do this? And then, you know, you're like, oh, wait, hey, by the way, I'm the, I'm the videographer. And it's just, it's just, it's, it's hard to jump in like that. So does that kind of answer the question? Kind of. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, I've watched your videos, sharing it everywhere, like, this is what you're supposed to do. But um, the, uh, my last wedding that I just shot a video for, like, two weeks ago, the main and the second shooter brought a 24 and a 35. <laughs> Wait, the photographer or the videographer? Did? No, she was video. No, I'm video. I was video. Me and my second were videoing, and there was a main and a photographer who doesn't do weddings, by the way. She was hired because of her style, not because she had mm -hmm. weddings. And so um, I've been doing it for 15 years, and so she would kind of look at me, thankfully, because I reached out to her, she would kind of look over her shoulder and go, Is this okay? You think this is okay? Yeah. And I'd be like, Yes, but move away because like both of them were doing this. They're so close, right? Both of them were yeah. side by side, yeah. right up on them. And I was like, I don't understand what's happening. Like, yeah. move away, you know. But anyway, so like my thing was, 
We don't talk about that beforehand. We kind of find out on the wedding day right. that they're and doing it. You, I think that might need to be addressed is like, how do you nicely say, uh, one of you can do this, but the other one needs to be away so that I can. Mm -hmm. I don't think we ever really address what the uh, question is talking about. The photographer is one with the 24, one with the 35, and just, you know, how do you approach that? Because he had the dialogue kind of going into the wedding day. I don't think we've ever told the photographer. The only thing I will tell a photographer or ask a photographer is to turn off their shutter beep, because um, a lot of photographers leave it on. I'll ask him to turn it off because that'll kill audio. But otherwise, it's just about having that good communication, choosing your battles about what you want to kind of like go to, f or what you want to. You know what I mean? Choosing your battles of what you want to try to focus on in terms of you know changing or modifying their behavior, what they're doing. We, we tend to work around those situations. Uh, we don't, uh, but there are some situations which will kind of step in, you know, maybe for portrait. It's more about like the portraits about like, you know, because you'll have two photographers, you'll just getting in on the portrait section and then it's just about vocalizing and saying, hey, do you mind if we get a, a shot real quick? Do you guys mind coming, stepping back? We just, we want to get a wide. Yeah, unfortunately, like you'll have to do all, a lot of your own stuff because they are not allowing you to work together and we did that like me and my second we worked together before and um we would we waited until they were done doing their stuff and we said do you mind if we step in and as soon as we set up our shot they're like oh that's nice Whoop, came right back in uh, and i was like all right now i'm gonna have to like, i've got an extra 70 to 200 do you guys want to try it out and uh, see how it is yeah that's definitely frustrating and we still have we still work with photographers that there ends up being a little bit of friction even though we're trying to play nice and we end up having to I would say wedding photographers in general are not like that. But right. When in this situation they were not wedding photographers. Yeah. They were when you're photographers that hired. The yeah. lower budget, as I was saying, you run into lower budget photographers. So mm -hmm. you're fighting that same kind of scenario that hasn't really worked it done many weddings. Oh, I'm going to shoot my third wedding, or I'm shooting my, you know, second wedding, or this is my first wedding. I had several of those who were shooting their first. And I'm looking at the gear, and they've got one, maybe two lenses. Mm -hmm. And so, and they're not used to working with video. They've never worked with one. And so, you, you, that happens a lot with the lower ends. Yeah, and that's I, I, ironically, they were high end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've seen it high end too. With the video, still, what they get right in the, in the, in the yeah. shot. But I understand. Um, uh, when you talk to them uh, and you're doing the uh, portraits, and you can say, okay, I'm not going to skip in because you're the or whatever. But when they're in the middle of the ceremony, there's nothing you can do to. We just reposition. I mean, if it's the middle of the ceremony, we'll you're reposition. The shot, the angle, they're they're right. in the safety shot. I mean, you can't change that. I mean, there's some things. But the things shots that are going to be in the cinematic film, we make sure we adjust so that we're not right. in this. Or for, the, or for the documentary, they're in the shot, we're not going to worry about it. Right. But even, I mean, even in the cinematic edit, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll show a wide shot once in a while, but I mean, right? We yeah, we will. I mean, but not photographers in it. But, okay, so we have a whole section on how to work with a photographer. Okay, so we'll cover this stuff. <laughs> All the hands go down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I noticed you said something about your colors reflecting the type of people you're targeting, which I found interesting. I was just wondering if you could maybe expand on that and you just mean like website and stuff? Or well, no, I was talking about the, the, the question was more about like the colors with editing affecting, you know, being a factor in terms of what your branding is. It, it, because it's all about the uniqueness style, you know, because you've all seen, um, if you've been on forums, you see people talking about the LUTs and everyone wants a lot, you know, because a lot is a fast track to kind of like having your own custom color that everyone else is using. But, you know, it's just having, the color, the color is, colorizing of your film is part of that uniqueness part of you because some people will will gravitate more towards that. You know the the muted colors. Um, the people, a lot of people love that look. Uh, versus, you know, we go after more of a natural color that we we, we have. I mean, we have. Yeah, a, it's colorful but contrasty. Um, even though I love the look of like faded film, but. That's okay, so you were talking more specifically about using colors in the films, not versus like website. Well, it, it's both. I mean, it, it both can be used. Um, we, we, we like the look of a white. I mean, 
white is more bridal, it's more, you know, because, and also most of our clients who are seeking us out are, are female. That's not even why but we do white. Oh, what do we do white with? is more because, again, if you look at the brands like Louis Vuitton, Rolex, they, you know, they have just a very clean white background. Um, you know, our, our, our logo, I think, is color, it's kind of like a grayish blush, but it's very neutral. You know, um, imagine like if you have a logo that's bright red, that's going to communicate something totally different than something soft and subtle or romantic. It kind of just depends, you know, what direction you want to go. So something edgy would be a lot more bright and bold. Um, so. It's great as a homework assignment to kind of like figure out what brands you love personally and go to, the, go to their website, go to their social media and find out how those brands communicate their brand through their, their usages. And you'll realize that um, there's so much intentionality with what they do about, you know, colors, fonts and everything mm -hmm. that are communicating who they are. That you don't even realize it, but almost on a subconscious level, you're associating them with a certain type of feeling or style. And great websites to look at too is clothing websites. If you're really attracted to like anthropology or attracted to Abercrombie and Fitch, I don't even know if they're relevant anymore, but um, <laughs> or Banana Republic, you know, because those are all going to be kind of different people. Um, honestly, if you're looking like where does your client shop, look at that website and see are they more earthy or hipster or you know kind of all that kind of different stuff. So. So this year I've been trying to integrate having a little more control of the day, but also not being set on sales like you're talking about. The being really easy to work with the vendors. Um, and I found a lot of the companies that I kind of idolize in, in this industry, I'm like, well, they're controlling way more of the situation. They're sometimes spending multiple days with a couple, and they're doing this and that to get what they're getting, so it's not really a level playing field. Mm -hmm. So this year I'm trying to, I try to integrate stuff like, okay, if I need letters, then I'll just come earlier, not get anybody's way as long as the couple is very aware of it. I'll get those knocked out for talk to the kids there. That way I'm not dealing with shutter. I'm not having to ask for that stuff, I'm just getting it done. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, I'm sacrificing more hours mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, and stuff like uh, talking to DJ, hey, can you give me 10 minutes before the toast so that I can set up a spotlight on it? You know, all the little things that you can kind of dictate. Um, I'm just trying to find that line to be like, man, this guy makes it so much easier instead of, oh my God, he needs so much. He needs me to do so much mm -hmm. to get what he needs. So trying to find that balance is kind of, mm -hmm. and I'm sure I'll probably talk about that with your day flow later, but. Do we talk about with the photographer about finding that balance of kind of well, like I think control he's over well, the situation? Well, I think he's talking more about um, how do you be an accommodating okay. videographer yeah. uh, and still have all my demands? I think it, it, to kind of communicate that, it, it's, it's really good to start off with, you know, having that talk with the, uh, your couple Ahead of the ahead of the wedding to kind of see to gauge them to see if this is important to them to see if like you know because the thing is if they're falling in love with your films if they're falling in love with certain elements they're going to want to accommodate you uh, for those requests on the wedding day so it's great for, the, for them to know that because they'll be a lot more they will be a lot more accommodating. I, I still think I don't, is he answering your question because I feel like it's about us being accommodating. Um, right. You know, we talked a while back about how you can bring your own microphone for tests and stuff like that, like, and not, like, how do you do that without, like, taking off DJ and he's ruining your name, you know, like. So how are we not hard to work with? That's what he wants to know. How are we not hard to work with? <laughs> Where you keep that good, you know, rapport with other vendors, but you're also, like, this dude's going to get what he needs, no matter what. I mean, I tell people, I mean, I, I'll tell people, I told the, the photographer last weekend, I know we can be difficult to work with at times, but. Uh, good communication is the start of that, to kind of, like, good communication will, will ease over a lot of difficulty, you know, letting people know what you want to do, but <clears throat> especially with like the DJ and stuff like that, I, and I talk about this later, but one of the first things I'm doing with the DJ or the band is I'm not asking them for a feed or asking them to, for help. I'm, I'm asking them for their card and saying, hey, look, you know, we're going to get a lot of great shots of you. Uh, give me your card so that way we can make sure to tag you in a film. It makes them really receptive to doing whatever it takes to make your job easier to make them look good. Um, kind of like the same thing with like the, the planner a little bit, trying to be a, easy to work, uh, trying to be like communicating well, making sure that you're out to promote them. And I think that kind of like will ease over a lot of those tensions about like being difficult to work with. Give with, before you take. Yeah. Give before you take. I'm a mm -hmm. huge advocate of that. With photographer, it's more just about communication. And mutual be respect too. And mutual respect yeah. because you're not really going to do anything that's going to benefit the photographer. 
but just communicating with them is not 90% more than what they're used to. And they're, they're hugely accommodating of certain things within reason if you're communicating before it, beforehand. But if you just do it and then try to apologize afterwards, it's not, it's not nearly as good. And that kind of like sets the tone for the rest of the day. It, we will definitely get into that a, l- a little bit more. But you know, it's, it's, it's important questions to bring up, especially during branding. Because again, you know, being e- trying, I mean, being easy, it's not always about being easy to work with. It's, you know, because it's about accommodating mutual respect. It's about communication. And those are the really, those are the things to really focus on. Yeah, it's not about caving to what you need. Like, oh, I guess we can't do that. It's, we still make sure we get what we need, but we're just really nice about it, respectful, and um, they usually value what we do, you know, when we're... Like, I found, I guess, at Atlanta weddings, I found there's more um, target, I don't even know what you'd call it, it's like editorial or whatever, mm-hmm. they're not going to do any reactions, they're not going to do any... Photojournalistic. Yeah, they're just going to get the moment, and they're not going to do any posing. Well, it's definitely hard, especially if like if you know there's no time in the schedule to do posing. It's just it is what it is. We'll we'll have films where we we don't have any pose shots, and we just we will find different elements of the day to kind of you know. But usually, I mean, assuming there's time, I mean, if there's no time in the schedule, a lot of times you can just quickly get in a couple of different things. You know, over the course of one to two minutes, as opposed to you know trying to carve out a bigger spot of time. We'll, we'll get into we'll get into more of that later. But just in terms of for the the branding part, it's a great question. Just about you know, it's not about being a bully to get what you want. It's about being you know, accommodating, mutual respect, communication. I probably need to to move along a little bit because I'm a little bit behind. Is this our break? Do you guys want to take a quick five minute break for? I mean, we have lunch in about forty five minutes or so. Do you want to do five minutes when we'll meet back? Back here.